But anyway, we, uh, we have been going through the Bible for some time here at Tate's Creek, and um, we would encourage you to open your Bibles now to Amos, and we it, were introduced last Sunday evening to Amos, and we're going to get into a little more depth uh, in our study of Amos in this message, and uh, we encourage you to follow along because I'm going to go quickly. Uh, Amos is a very powerful, powerful study from one of the minor prophets. And remember, the prophets we're looking at now are not referred to as minor prophets because their message is less significant or less important than the others. It's just simply because there's not as many chapters as there is in some of the other larger prophetic books. But Amos has a powerful, powerful message that we want to see and even though that the message today will hit the highlights of the book of Amos and the prophecies of Amos, I would encourage you to go home and read some more of Amos. There is just so much powerful message in Amos. In the last message, we were introduced to Amos verse 1, uh, and we talked quite a bit about prophets why God used prophets, why he sent prophets, and what the role of prophets were as they came to deliver the word of God. And so we were introduced to that in verse 1, and we learned that Amos was a shepherd, a farmer, if you will, that God called to preach the word of God. And I think the fact that Moses, or rather Amos, came from a background of being a farmer just goes to show that God will use any of us. Amen? And he will take us from wherever we've been in life and whatever we have done, and he will use us to his glory because it's not about us or where we come from in life. It's all about him. And so God used this great uh, prophet of God in a mighty way. Well, let's get started. In the first two chapters of Amos, what you find is God speaking. Verse 2 says that the Lord roars from Zion. The title of this message is that the lion roars. And what you're getting in the book of Amos is God speaking to the people about their lives and God responding to those who are not responsive to him. In chapters 1 and 2, there are eight nations that God pronounces judgment on. Six of those nations are Gentile nations. And you see them mentioned. The Lord roars, the Bible says. And then as you go through chapter 1 and verse Three, the Bible says that thus says the Lord. And he re- reminds us of the sins of Damascus. As you go on down uh, to verse 6, the Bible says thus says the Lord. And here he speaks of the sins of Gaza. When you come to verse 9, thus says the Lord. And he speaks of the sins of Tyre. In verse 11, thus says the Lord. And he speaks of the sins of Edom. In verse 13, thus says the Lord, as he speaks to the sins of the Ammonites. And verse 1 of chapter 2, uh, he thus says the Lord, and he speaks of the sins of the Moabites. In verse 4 of chapter 2, thus says the Lord, and there he speaks now to the sins of Judah. When you read on down to verse 6 of chapter 2, thus says the Lord, and he speaks to the sins of Israel. Now, we learn some vital lessons by just reading those chapters. And that is, God responds to the sins of nations. He refers in these passages to fire. You see that in verse 4, 7, 10, 12, and 14 of chapter 1. And in chapter 2, verses 2 and 5, he refers to this fire. And throughout these chapters, you see God saying of the sins of the people, He's going to send fire. He's going to send fire. What does it mean that God sends fire? It is another way of saying that I will send judgment. Because fire represents the holiness and the judgment of God. And so when you're reading in Bible prophecy, the references to fire will most of the time be referring to the judgment of God that's based on God's holiness and his judgments. And so we see that in numerous verses. So what God is saying to us in these two chapters as he deals with these eight different nations is the fact that God God holds nations responsible. We have to understand that the United States of America or any other nation is responsible to God. 
and that God deals with the sins of any people. God deals with the sins of this nation. As much as we love the United States of America, and we do, and we have people that are in this congregation and listening to this message that have fought for this country and you've sacrificed for this country and either you or family members have fought for this country and we love this nation and we, we take hold in our lives of the values of this nation. But as, lo- as much as we love the United States of America, we have to understand there is a greater ruler than this nation and that is God. And that the United States of America is responsible to a holy, righteous God. And so when we read these passages about these nations, we find God dealing with them about three basic things. One, God deals with them about how they're treating other people. And as you read through these chapters, you find that they were treating people really bad. I mean, they didn't care who they ran over in order to make money for themselves, in order to gain for themselves. They didn't care who they trampled over. They didn't try to help the poor. They didn't try to help people who couldn't eat. They treated people really, really bad. They took advantage of people. And God said, I will deal with you because of this sin. Another thing we find is the motives for their actions. Why are they doing this? And most of the time for these nations, it was because of their sin that God said your motives are wrong. It was not for the glory of God. It was not for the purposes of God. It was for the purposes of themselves. And God was holding them accountable. Now another reason we see are just the actual sins committed. There are things that the Bible points out to us that are sin. And despite what your culture may tell you, there are rights and wrongs. And you live in a culture today who tells you there's no moral absolutes, but God says there are moral absolutes, and you are accountable to God for the absolutes of God. And so God deals with sin. He always deals with it. And as we go through this, you're going to see how God deals with these sins. Now, remember this, though, that nations are responsible to God. And so to take home with you today in your notes, one of the things we want you to remember is that God judges the nations. God judges the nations. Now, a couple of other things we want to see here is that there's a phrase that you've probably already noticed as you were going through these verses. You notice that there's a phrase that you'll see as God deals with these nations. And it's the phrase that says that for three transgressions and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. So what does that mean? When God says for three transgressions and for four, what does that mean? And it's used eight times in reference to all of these eight nations, by the way. It's a Jewish phrase that referred to an indefinite number that has finally come to an end. So what does that mean? It means that, the, that God is dealing with the sins. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, there's a verse that we look at from time to time in our church here at Tate's Creek. But in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, Peter said it this way. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance, that all should come to repentance. So there are times when people look around at their nation or they look around at their world they live in and they think, well, everybody gets by with sin. That means it's okay. That God's not going to deal with our sins. People just keep going on and on and doing these things. God must not be paying attention. God must not be going to deal with it because years have passed and these things have been going on. God must not care. God must not watch it. But I want to remind you, listen to what the Word of God says. God sees and He knows the sins of any people. And even though God may be patient, there's coming a time when the patience of God with sinners will run out. It's going to run out. Now, I want to remind you, and I've said this many times, I think there's an element of encouragement to it in reverence to the verse I just read. Because... People ask me from time to time, why hasn't God just wiped this nation out? I mean, we got these problems with abortion. We got these problems with, you know, 70 million babies that have been killed in our nation in abortion. We got all of these problems with abuse and sexual abuse and child abuse and murders. And we have the terrorists doing all these things. Why doesn't God just wipe us all out? Well, 2 Peter 3, 9 told us why. It's because the Bible says it's not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But I, remember, I want to tell you two things about that. One, the good news is 
God hasn't wiped this country out yet because he wants you to be saved. If there's never been a time in your life when you've invited Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, God has given you that opportunity right now. There are people listening in several states right now on the radio. There are people who will tune in to us on the internet, whether it's our website or whether it's iTunes or iHeart, however you're listening to this message. I want you to know that you have an opportunity right now to give your life to Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior, to forgive you of your sins, to give you a new life, a new start, an eternal home in heaven. Today is your opportunity. But I must, in fairness, also tell you this. That does not mean the opportunity is going to be there tomorrow. That does not mean the opportunity is going to be there another day. Because even though God is patient, and even though God has delayed His judgment, based on His loving, merciful, gracious kindness, and he's given you this opportunity to be saved, that does not mean that you're promised an opportunity tomorrow. And so in all fairness to you, I want to tell you that God offers to you salvation and forgiveness today, but there's no promise that you'll have that opportunity tomorrow. For the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. And so remember to take that home, that God is patient with sinners but his patience will eventually run out. Now, let's go to chapters 3 through 6. We're going to go through this entire book of Amos. You didn't know you were going to hear a sermon on all these chapters today, did you? And so we're going now from 3 to 6. Here, the people are called upon to hear God's word. Notice how many times we will see this phrase in these chapters, hear this word. You're going to see it at the beginning of chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. Hear God's Word. Now, for most of us, um, for example, if most of us guys go home today and we ask our wives to listen to something we're about to say, most likely they're not going to hear us, in some, right? But if she speaks, you better make sure you listen, amen? And so... Uh, when God speaks, when God speaks, you really better make sure you listen. God himself is talking to you. Don't you think maybe that deserves some attention? I mean, if you knew that God himself were standing here in this auditorium, I'm not going to point toward myself, but I mean, if God himself were standing here in the auditorium and God was to say, I want to tell you something, so listen. How many of you would listen? Oh, I am. But did you know that his word says that? Hear this word. God is saying, listen to what I'm about to say to you. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. And so the message is clear that God's people had sinned. That's what he talks about in these verses of these chapters 3 through 6. He points out the sins that they had committed against him. It's not that he's trying to be mean to them. He's trying to point them to the fact of how they need him. He even reviews with them the blessings that he had given to them in the past. He, he pours out his heart by telling them, you've disobeyed me. You've turned against me. I've done all of these things for you because I love you and I want you to be walking with me. And so in these verses, he de you'll notice too another phrase that's, that's stated over and over again when he says, hear this word, then he will tell them their sins and he'll tell them what they need to hear. And then at the end of those phrases, he uses the words, declares the Lord. So hear this word, declares the Lord. It's very important for us to pay attention to this. Now, I, wanna, I do want to point out something, a couple of phrases too, that I think are very important. One of them is in chapter 4 and verse 12. If any of you are from eastern Kentucky, you will have seen this. Uh, in my early years of life living in, in eastern Kentucky, Quite often, as I would be driving around eastern Kentucky, there's some pretty sharp turns up there, right? And you'd be driving along the highway uh, there, and, and it's still there in some places. But you'd turn a lot of these curves, and you'd see these big signs on the side of the road, prepare to meet God. And I mean, the way some of those roads were, it was not unreasonable to think, you know, that could be pretty soon if you got to driving too fast. But there was a guy in southeastern Kentucky who decided that that was the way he was going to tried to be a witness and a testimony to other people. And so this gentleman would build these crosses and 
he had them on the side of the road all over eastern Kentucky. And most of you have probably seen that. But it comes from Amos chapter 4 and verse 12. When God is speaking to the people about turning to him, he says, Therefore I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. There's been a lot of times where I've talked to individuals who were near death. And there were times where that would be asked them, Are you prepared to see God face to face? Are you prepared to meet God? I've heard other people say that. Nearing death, they would say, I'm ready. I'm ready now to meet God. I'm ready to meet my maker. And it's based on these words that God wants us all to know that we are accountable to him. And there's coming a day when we will face him. Now, I mentioned two or three weeks ago this, this thought that God had given to me while I was reading the Bible and praying recently. And that was just this picture of people standing before God. Now, I will tell you, for those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, that's a beautiful experience. Because we're going to see our precious Savior face to face, and it's beautiful fellowship. And I'll never answer to God for my sins, because my sins were judged on the cross. That's why Jesus died on the cross. He took my judgment for him. And so I'll never stand before the judgment of God for my sins, because that was taken care of on the cross. And so for me as a believer, to be in the presence of God is a beautiful thing in his presence. And I'm looking forward to that day when I will see him face to face. But for that one who does not know Jesus as their Savior, think of that horrific scene. It's a scene that the Bible describes as the great white throne judgment of God, where those who have refused to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will one day stand before a holy righteous God. And this holy, righteous God that I'm referring to, Jehovah God, is pure in every way. In every way, He is holy. In every way, He is righteous. There is no flaw in Him. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches that His glory is so wonderful. It is referred to in Scripture as the Shekinah glory of God. And what that means is, is that God is so pure and holy, that light comes off of him. That's called the Shekinah glory of God. And as a result of God being that holy, and his Shekinah glory and countenance is so bright, there's no need for lights in heaven. There's no need for sun or moon or any kind of light fixtures in heaven because the glory of God lights up heaven. Isn't that powerful? And this glorious, wonderful Shekinah glory of God you will stand before this holy God. You will not have your title of where you worked. You will not have one red penny to bring that day. You will not have a title. You will not have a penny. You will not have a credentials of who you know and who's influential. You will not have any credentials of what offices you held upon this earth. It's just you and God. And the Bible teaches us that He will say to you, Depart from me. I never knew you. Saddest words that anyone will ever hear is when God says, Depart from me. I never knew you. How sad it is. Prepare to meet God. Prepare to meet God. You're prepared to meet Him face to face in glory by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ that His death on the cross and his bloodshed on the cross was sufficient in the eyes of God to take away your sins. And he died on that cross shedding his blood for our sins. And that was sufficient in the eyes of God to be my judgment for my sins. That's, that's what was necessary. Is what Jesus did on the cross. I don't understand everything involved, but by faith I believe that. I believe that somehow Jesus' death on the cross and his bloodshed on that cross was sufficient in the eyes of God to provide for me forgiveness of my sins so that I would never face judgment and I could walk in uninhibited fellowship with God for all eternity. What a glorious day that's going to be. Are you prepared to meet God? There's another phrase I want you to see when you come to chapter 5. Mark this in your notes, verse 6. Seek the Lord and live. Seek the Lord and live. 
That's the answer. Seek the Lord and live. Now, when you come to chapter 7 through 9, this is the last section of Amos. In chapter 7 through 9, here we have a listing, and you can see it on the screen. You can, you can mark them down. I'm not going to go through all of them. But I do want you to see that God describes how that these judgments will come upon them because of their sins. He describes how that locust will come, how fire will destroy, uh, how there will be a plumb line. And he shows Amos a basket of fruit and describes the ruined temple. And so God describes these judgments that are going to come upon them because not only because of their sin, but because of their refusal to repent. You see that? God doesn't just judge you because of your sins. He judges you because you've sinned against Him and you've refused Him. You've refused Him. You've refused to turn to Him. You have refused to repent and turn to God. And so when you come to the last several verses of chapter 9, though, God offers hope. When you come to verse 11 of chapter 9, there's three words, take a note of it, in that day. Now, anytime you read a phrase like that when you're reading the Bible, in that day, you have to stop and ask yourself the question, what day? In that day, in what day? It's the day when Jesus returns. In that day, he refers in verse 11 about how he's going to repair, how he's going to raise, he's going to rebuild. And so he offers to them a message of hope. That even though you've sinned against God and even though you have refused to repent and you've refused to turn to Him, there is this message of hope that God offers to you. That if you will come to Him, you will turn to Him, repent of your sins and turn to Him, there's restoration that takes place in your life. No matter where you've been in life, the sins you've committed, the horrific past that you've had, your refusal and rejection of God, your disobedience to Him, you turn to Him and He will love on you and He will restore you and He will bring you home. What a beautiful message of the gospel this is. Now, take home with you this message that God judges with mercy, justice, and He does it completely. It is complete. And just like God judges the nations and He does it completely, guess what? When Jesus died on the cross... Our sins were judged completely. Amen? And praise the Lord for that. He judges with mercy, justice, and He does it completely. Now, I want to review with you some of these take-home points for your notes. One of them, is the first thing we saw was that God judges the nations. And our nation needs to hear this message that we're accountable to God. Number two, God is patient with sinners but his patience will eventually run out. Number three, to reject God's word is to reject God. Don't forget it. To reject God's word is to reject God. Number four, God judges with mercy, justice, and he does it completely. Now, here's a beautiful passage in the book of Revelation that gives to us this picture of God in all of his holiness and all of his grandeur, Revelation chapter 19 says it this way. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Now, it doesn't say they kind of did this, because here's the way we are at Tate's Creek most of the time. Somebody, uh, let's say hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, hallelujah, if I have to, hallelujah. But that's not the language of the Bible. That's not the language of heaven. You remember last week we did this thing where we said from the message that we were looking at that that leper came to Jesus after he was healed and he cried out with that megaphone voice, thank you, with a megaphone voice, thank you. It was like a megaphone. And in heaven when we read about these crying out before Jesus, it's not this obligatory thing that many of us feel when it's like, well, hallelujah. And I'll say, and all God's people said, well, amen. Well, if I have to, hallelujah. If I have to, well, amen. That's not the language of Scripture. The language of Scripture is from the heart. The language of Scripture is boisterous. 
The Bible says in heaven we don't stand before Jesus and with this obligatory language, well, praise you. No, it's God's people crying out. And from the very depths of our hearts, our whole life has been changed and we have been glorious, forgiven of our sins and we have gloriously been able to be saved and forgiven and be saved from the judgment of God and to be saved from judgment that is to come and we stand before him and we see him face to face and we think about where we would have been without Jesus and without his death, burial and resurrection and the Bible says that God's people cried out, hallelujah hallelujah Woo! glory to God hallelujah salvation and glory and power belong to our God his judgments are true and just. What a Savior, what a God that we have. You look on through Revelation 19, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory. That's the scene of worship in heaven. As we praise Him for who He is. We praise Him for what He's done in our lives. That's the message Amos gives to us. I read this week about how years ago, years ago when the warships were not like they are now, we have nuclear uh, aircraft carriers and we have nuclear uh, you know powered uh, ships nowadays but back in the days when the naval vessels were still wooden and they were traveling around into battle there were times when they were getting ready to enter into this battle and the captain would tell his men to climb up the mast and he would say what I want you to do is climb up that mast and I want you to take our flag don't want it on the rope I want you to take the flag and I want you to nail it to the mast. And what he was telling the men was this. We're going to go into battle. And there's no chance we're going to bring that flag down and surrender. We're nailing the flag to the mast. Because we will never give up. We will never surrender. We're going to win the war. And I read that this week and I thought, wouldn't it be great... If we would get before God and we would nail to the mast of this battleship that we're on and we will say to God, I'm not going to live my life in a compromising way where I can bring the flag down when I want to. I'm not going to live my kind of life where I'm going to bring the flag down and raise a white flag up and surrender. But what I'm going to do is climb that mast and I'm going to take a hammer and I'm going to take a nail and I'm going to nail that flag to the mast because I will not surrender. I will not compromise. I will not quit. For my God is a mighty God. What a Savior He is. The answer, Amos chapter 5, verses 4 and 6, both says, Seek me and live. Seek the Lord and live. That's where it's at. That's life. Seek the Lord and live. He is what we're looking for. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, as we study the prophecies, we realize that the reason you point out judgment is not out of a heart of hatred. It's out of a heart of love. You're calling us to yourself. You're calling us to Jesus so that we would understand that Jesus Christ came to this earth and he died on a cross to take our judgment for us. And that when you died on the cross, the, the most painful part of the death on the cross was, was not the, the beating you took before you were nailed to the cross. It was not the shame and the embarrassment of being nailed to that cross naked. It was not the pain of, of, of people spitting on you or, or the pain of the physical pain you suffered. The greatest pain was when as you hung there on that cross, God placed on you my sin. That was the most painful part 
of your death on the cross because there my sin was judged. And Jesus, I don't understand everything there is to know about how that works. But I do know enough to know this. I desperately need what you have to offer. I need forgiveness. I need a new life. I need a change. The only way that's going to happen, Jesus, is for me to commit my life to you. And Father, help me to understand that even though we have freedom, we are responsible. And with responsibility comes accountability. And I thank you that Jesus took care of my sins so that I can live an uninhibited, beautiful fellowship with God for all eternity. But God, my heart breaks for those who've refused you. And I know, Father, that the experiences of life and what's going on around us today, that you're calling men and women and children to come to you in repentance and to turn from our sins to Christ. You tell us to seek you and we'll find life. And I pray that's what we will do right now. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing an invitation.